Stop, stop loving one another so much. Stop the love. Why don't you have a seat? Wow. That's awesome. Now sit down and be quiet. Uh, Mary Beth's going to read uh, the scripture uh, this morning. Good morning. I'm going to read the entire chapter of John 13. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress. The devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew, he knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you, you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said, not every one was clean. When he'd finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes, returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. I'm not referring to all of you, I know those I have chosen, but this is to fulfill this passage of scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. I'm telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Very truly, I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After he'd said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, very truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then, dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, what you're about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charged the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the feast or give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I'm going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. 
as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you'll disown me three times. I'd like to answer the question uh, during my last sermon. How do we take really good care of one another? I'd like to answer that question. I think it's of utmost importance to Jesus Christ, the answer to that question. I think in this, what we call the farewell discourse in John chapter 13. So in John 13 begins what we call the farewell discourse. This is the last things Jesus said to these apostles. So it's 13, 14, 15, and 16. They're sitting in this room. They're around the table. Jesus does these things that we read about. Um, And then 1633 ends. The very next thing that we learn in the text is that chapter 17 is that Jesus prays. Do you remember Romans chapter 8? He is interceding for us. He did this right, the very next thing he did before he was arrested is he prayed for the world. He prayed for you, he prayed for me, he prayed for those who would believe through our ministries. Um, He prayed and he's still praying. And so I want to answer the question though. How do we take really good care of one another? Are you with me? Do you think it's important? Do you think that we're batting a thousand? Do you think it would make a difference if we would learn how to do this and actually do it? As the rule, not the exception. The word on the street in the United States of America is that that the church is not living up to this. Did you know that? I think Jesus Christ gave our culture permission to judge us by this commandment. Do you see the logic in verse 33 and 34, right? By this, they will know that you are my disciples if you love one another the way that I've loved you. I don't know about you. I think we have some work to do on this. And so that's what we're going to talk about today, all right? So Father, bless us as we spend some time under the authority of your word. Um, Help me to get out of the way. I pray that you would just speak uh, through me, whatever uh, that is that you want these precious people to hear this morning. And uh, we do thank you uh, for your great love for us, Lord. Thank you that you paid it all. Um, All hail the name of Jesus. Holy, holy, holy. Um, And so, Father, have your way as we spend some time in your word in the name of Jesus. So there are a few things that I pick out of this particular text to answer the question, how are we going to take really good care of one another? The first thing is in verse 3 where Jesus has said, uh, Jesus knew some things. You see that? Jesus knew. What did he know? He, He knew that the Father had given him all power. How important is identity to a human being? What we think about ourselves, who we think we are, determines everything about us. Would you agree? Identity is really, really important. If I am going to be a man, if you're going to be a man or a woman or a child who is going to learn how to follow in Jesus' steps and take really good care of one another, we have got to do this work that Jesus is talking about right here, that he knew who he was. He knew knew his authority. He knew that the Father had given him 
all power. He knew where he came from and he knew where he was going. And when you study the life of Jesus Christ and what he taught us, uh, both in the red letters in the gospel, but also the, through the apostles, is that he wants you and I to have a solid understanding of who we are in Christ. Would you agree with that biblically? That is of utmost importance that we know who we are. One of the things that we learn in scripture that we are is we are people who possess the same authority that Jesus Christ possessed. Does it make sense to us? But he says that in Christ, we are seated with him in the heavenly realms at the right hand of God, reigning with him. Colossians chapter three, the first three verses, if you want that proof passage. We reign with him. Um, we learn in Romans 1.16 uh, that the gospel, the power of God is in the gospel. And God has given the pow our power through the gospel to be saved. And so if you're a person who has submitted yourself under the gospel, that Jesus Christ died for you, rose for you, and you've put your faith in him, you, are, you possess the power of the gospel living within you. When Jesus died and when he rose again, that was power, right? Well, one of the prayers that Paul has in Ephesians 1 is that they would know the same power lives in them that reigned in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That same power is in them. And so one of the things, I don't know if this is part of your identity as a follower of Jesus Christ, but you have been given the same authority, the same power that Jesus Christ has. I think it's really important that we pivot, though, in the text and say how we use that power, how he used that power. Would you agree? Would you agree that their power can be misused? It can be weaponized in all sorts of ways, correct? Politically, religiously, maybe, maybe the sickest of all is religious power used in the wrong way. Would you agree? Throughout human history. Abuse at the hands of, of the church of Jesus Christ needs to stop. We need to have a different message coming reflected off of our culture about the local church. This needs to be the safest place in the world for a human being to come and be who they are and find out who they can become in Jesus Christ. That's how we're going to use our power if we're going to be pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you agree with that? Would you agree that we're not doing the best at that? Would you even be willing this morning to agree that maybe you've had a part to play in that? I think the answer, you guys, for this person is yes, I have participated in that. And I am working under the power that Jesus gives me to be a person who loves every human being right where they are at. Who sees them and validates them as a human being. Not using the power and the authority I have for my own interests, but for the interests of another human being. So how is it that we are going to take really good care of one another? We have to have our, identify, our identity really solid like Jesus said. He knew who he was. He knew the power he had. He knew where he came from. Do you know where you came from? You came from God. God put you together, according to Psalm 139, in your mommy's womb. He knows everything about you. And he loves and he likes everything about you. He has made you in his image. You are his image bearer. And so is every other human being that you ever look at. They're made in the image of God. And not only that, they're worth the blood of Jesus Christ. Their value, they have eternal value in the eyes of God. Every human being. This is how God showed us through Jesus Christ how to use power. He knew where he came from. You know where you come from. You came from God. He made you in his image to be an image bearer and to live out this truth that we're learning in John 13. And not only did he have this power, Jesus, he knew about the power. He knew where he came from. He knew where he was going. <laughs> and in Christ, 
you too know where you're going. You get to be in the presence of God for eternity, not because of anything you have done or not done, but because of his great love for you. He used his power to save you, not to condemn you. He continues to use his power today to intercede for you, moment by moment. Why do you need intercession? Just look in the mirror. Right? Come on, let's be honest. I, I cannot do this without him. And without his love and without his acceptance and without his forgiveness at every turn in my life. Joe, I wish it wasn't true for a pastor. <laughs> oh, if you only knew. And that's why we don't let Mary Beth preach this morning. <laughs> I'm smart. Mary Beth and I have absolutely loved our life with you at Pleasant Valley Church. Absolutely enjoyed our time with you. Um, we feel it a great blessing. And I, the thing that I am grieving maybe more than anything else is the grace of being a pastor. It is one of the most privileged places a human being can ever be. To somehow be allowed by God, called by God to be a pastor, a shepherd, and a group of people. I guarantee you, every one of us that are on staff feel the inadequacy every day. But we have to have our identity. I would say one of the things that's helped Mary Beth more, and I more than anything else is we know who we are. We're loved greatly by God. <clears throat> We're given the power that we need to accomplish the assignments that he gives to us. It's not our power. We know where we've come from and we know where we're going. We're secure. And I don't think we can take really good care of one another unless we're secure. I think we'll just be worried about comparing ourselves. I think we'll be worried about complaining. I think we'll be worried about the wrong things for the majority of our life. But it doesn't matter to me who you are, where you've been, what you've done. When I see you, thanks be to God, I see Jesus Christ. I see the resurrection. I see hope. I see potential. Every one of you. And I think this is one of the things that when, it, when, when we understand our identity, what get, begins to percolate up from us is this, this the same intuition, the same sensory, the, the same eyes, the ears, the, the feeling that Jesus has when he walked and he saw and he looked in the eyes of one another. But that come from this place of security. The next thing that I love about this passage, we're going to fast forward a little bit down to verse 23. Is it 23 or 21? 21. It says in this passage, right in the middle of it, Jesus was troubled. Just let that settle in here a little bit. Here is the king with all authority could step out of trouble at any moment. Could not, could choose not to take it anymore. The ridicule. The shaming, the misrepresentation, the, the twisting of his words, the abuse of his character. I love in this text that it, it helps us, it, it tips us into an understanding that we have got to have a, a theology, a practical theology of trouble and suffering. Jesus came to this world not as he wanted it. Jesus came to this world as it was. So please do not think just because you have all of this authority in Jesus Christ and you're secure in terms of who, where you've come from and where you're going, that that just is this recipe that everything is just going to be okay. It's just not. It wasn't for the it wasn't for the Lord, and he never did anything wrong. We deserve some trouble. Would you agree? He never did. 
I love it in the text where he's, he's, in, he's in this farewell discourse. You know, they're in the locker room and they're cheering one another on and they're hearing the last, the, the, the last words of their coach before they're sent out. He says, look, there's going to be trouble. Any athlete knows this. If you've ever played a sport, it's not going to go the way you want. Everybody knows this that's ever done in any, in any industry that you're part of or any activity you're part of. It never goes. Except for parenting, right? That always... <laughs> what is wrong with these people, Mary Beth? I mean, our kids, our kids have perfect parents. <laughs> Don't you think to have a relationship is to invite trouble? <clears throat> right it's part of life I, I love it I love that the, the scriptures never pull punches I, it just says no this is how it is Jesus was troubled in his spirit even a guy in his own team he knew was going to betray him he served him that communion that night he washed his feet that night he loved him to the end I think the watermark of Christianity under the lordship of Jesus Christ is to love your enemies and to pray for those who persecute you I think that's the watermark of Christianity What? It's trouble. And we use the authority that God has given to us and the security that we have in Christ to take care of people that don't want to take care of us. Protect other people's dignity even when they take away ours. Joe, this is craziness. Christianity is crazy. The grace of God is crazy. Why would he up front lavish grace on the human race who would kill him if they had a chance? And in the locker room, before game time, he's saying, look, it's going to be trouble out there. And you're going to get sucked into all sorts of the wrong battles out there. There was a, there was a guy um, that I played basketball with in high school and he had a thing called rabbit ears. He was, at the YMCA, he would be the best ball player on the court. Free, you know, it's, it's just no pressure, just out there and playing for the fun of it. When one fan said something bad about this person, it ruined his whole life. He couldn't play no more. He took it personal. Coach worked overtime. He, he could have been a great athlete. And I'm afraid some of us could be great followers of Jesus Christ, but sometimes we've got rabbit ears. We worry way too much about what somebody else is saying rather than concentrating on what God Almighty says is true about us and that being the bottom line. So there's going to be trouble. It's not going to always be fair. Would you agree with that? And you can do everything right and then the wrong thing comes down. That's okay. According to this, if, you, if you're going to be on his team and you're going to move forward, you've got, you got to learn how to face trouble. You can't have the expectation of if I just do A and B, then I'm just going to have awesome, wonderful, lollipop land Christianity. That's just not real. And not only did Judas betray him, you could say... The rock on which he built the church, Peter, denied him. Not only did Jesus have a lot of trouble from the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes, and all the religious leaders, not only did he have problems from the, Rome, uh, the Roman guard, he had trouble on the inside of the body in the church. Well, I'm not going to that church no more because he said, she said, yada, yada, yada. shouldn't be this way. Quite frankly, there should not be the denominations that there are on this planet. Would you agree with me or no on that? I want us, our church family, to live out these things, being so secure in who we are. 
facing trouble, facing injustice through the power and the love of Jesus Christ. I don't think there's any other way forward. No. <clears throat> you don't know how important what I'm going to continue to say is to at least my heart. Um, because Jesus loved anyway, with all the trouble, with all the betrayal, with all the denial, with all that, he, he loved anyway. Gave this new commandment, right? I want you to love one another the way that I have loved you. And see what's at stake so that the world would know that you're my disciples. There's a standing testimony that my resurrection power is still alive on the planet Earth through human beings who believe me and will love the way that I love, will treat one another the way that I treated. This year, you do not need a new president or an old president. You need to live under the political power of Jesus Christ. Amen. You and I need to use that power not to get our way in some horizontal cultural battle. We need to use our power in the church of Jesus Christ to serve one another, to love one another deeply from our heart. Do not think for a moment that Jesus Christ was, a, was apolitical. Jesus Christ, when he was born, the king who reigned at that moment wanted him dead. Why? Because he was a king born. He was crucified at the hands of a king, a political leader. And I guarantee you at some point in some way in every nation throughout history... Jesus can get in the way of what some political group wants to do. And the United States is not above that. We have one king. And we have one Lord. We do not, I'll vote, I'll tell you who I'm going to vote for. I'm going to write in Jesus Christ, King of Kings who I wrote in on, a, on, a, on the year 16 and the year 20. Because that's my allegiance. I'm not against voting for whoever you want to vote. Don't hear, don't hear me say that. You get to choose that. But I want to be reminded in my life, every day of my life, that my hope is not in a nation or in a human being. My hope is in Jesus Christ, my king, my president, my prime minister, the one who gets to govern the affairs of my life. And he wants to give me power, not power to use for my benefit, but power to use to love other people with his love because that's what changes the world. Amen. Finally, the last thing that Jesus says before he is going to be hauled off and arrested, Judas will come up pretty soon in the dark. He will kiss him on the cheek. He will have already told uh, the, the accusers that I, whoever I kiss on the cheek, that's him. So the last thing he says before they leave the locker room, go out on the field, he says this, these things I have spoken to you. Everything I've said from John chapter 13, verse 1, all the, th all the way through chapter 16, verse 32, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you might have peace. In this world you have trouble. It's a theme throughout his farewell discourse. He uses it four times in a discourse. 
chapter four, verse chapter fourteen, verse one, chapter fourteen, verse twenty-seven, the, the passage that we just read, and here, it's a theme. Trouble's a theme. I don't think that I can take really good care of other people if I'm not at peace with God and with myself. Would you agree with that? If I'm battling in my own head, if I'm worried about my own managing my own ego, my image, if I'm all tie, wrapped up in what's best for Joe, it's not going to work. And so 48 years ago, last night at about 7.30, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. This is the first day of my 49th year of walking with Jesus Christ. It is the best decision I've ever made for the reasons that we're talking about today. God has given me all the power that I could ever imagine and more. But not to use for Joe McConkey. But to use to love other human beings the way that Jesus Christ has loved me. And that's what I'm leaving you with today. But you're going to have to be at peace with God in your soul. You, you got to come to him in, in Jesus Christ, in his blood, in his resurrection power, in his death, in his crucifixion, in his ascension, in his reigning at the right hand, in his authority. You've got to come to Jesus and you just say, Jesus, I, I need you. He has no conditions on that. It, you don't have to get all right. You just have to say, Lord, I, I receive, I believe. And then it says in the scripture that he gives you the power to become his child. That's the verse, John 1, 12, that changed my life 48 years ago. It's John 1, 12. If you'll just receive him, Greg Hawk and Bruce Quinlan said to me in the basement of Wetzel Hall as an 18-year-old freshman, if you'll just receive him, Joe, <clears throat> believe in his name, he will give you the power and the authority to become his child right now. That's, that's entrance into this, y'all. Peace with God through Jesus Christ. And then peace with yourself. Settle it. You need a Savior every day of your life. You need grace every day. It's not just like you're saved by grace and now you can go on your own. No, that, you would be bewitched to think that you can continue on by yourself. You will absolutely need a power greater than yourself every moment of every day. So at peace with yourself every day through Jesus Christ. And then you can't help but have that spill over into your relationships with one another. I just want to be at peace with you. I want you to know that I hear you, that I see you, that I love you. Let's journey together. doesn't matter who I am or who you are. We just are at peace with one another because of our love for one another. I think this is how we take really good care of one another. And to me, I think that's the most important thing to Jesus Christ. So much is at stake if we don't. So much is at stake if we do. So the worship team's going to come on up. And then also we have a bunch of people that are going to be up here praying. And so if you would please come up, if you're a prayer person, come on up and kind of be on both sides of the platform. I want to tell you, um, it takes um, a lot of guts to be one of these people up here. Um, they're not any different from the rest of us. Um, so, matter of fact, just to kind of warm you up to them, I decided to, to announce the sin of every one of them. <laughs> what an absolute wretch they are. I can't believe that they're praying. They're just like you and me. They know the power of Jesus Christ, though, right? You know that power. They know where they've come from. They know where they're going to go. And they would love to look you in the eye and just pray for you, whether you have a request or not. Maybe you have a family member. You're like, my heart just is hurting for this family member. Would you pray? 
Maybe you're like, I'm not sure how to pray. Would you just pray for me? Just go up and just say, have some prayer. You know, maybe it's identity, something about your identity. It's like, I, I know I'm messed up in this area. Would you just help me grow into who God says that I am? You know, maybe you're wrestling with anxiety. Maybe it's depression. Maybe some suicidal ideation. It can be radical, right, sometimes. I don't want you to leave this place without being loved and heard and seen and have someone pray for you, encourage you. Some of you are just so grateful and you, gotta, you need to come up and just stand up and say, look, I, I just want somebody to thank God with right now for what's going on. Some of you um, need maybe to respond to some of Jesus' words in this text. Look, I have spent more time with Fox News or CNN than I have with Jesus, and I want to admit that today. I want to submit myself to Jesus Christ fully. I want him to be my king. I want to learn how to love my enemies, to pray for those who persecute me, whatever that is in your life. So this is what we'll do. In just a moment, we'll stand up. We're going to sing a song. We're still in our worship mode here, okay? This is part of the worship service. We're going to sing a song. Come on up and be prayed for during that song. After the song's over, I'll come up and dismiss you quietly. And then we'll have another song for people to continue to have prayer. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you for uh, letting uh, me bring the word of God to you um, today. I'm greatly privileged and greatly honored to be part of your church family. Um, I love every one of you deeply uh, from my heart. Uh, let's work at that together, okay? Let's learn to take really good care of one another for Jesus Christ. Deal? And everyone says deal. Yes. All right. Otherwise, I'll say the whole thing all over again. <laughs> Why don't you stand up and let's worship. Come on up for prayer, please.